Our top story this hour, the Yemeni army says it has launched a major drone and ballistic missile attack on Saudi Arabia. National Day of Resilience Operation targeted vital Saudi military headquarters and installations. It was carried out with 18 drones and 8 ballistic missiles. Armco oil facilities in Ras Hanura, Rabiq, Jizan, Yandu, and King Abdulaziz base in Dammam were targeted. Armed forces also targeted military sites in Najran and Asir with Qasif 2K drones. National Day of Resilience Operation successfully achieved its goals. We warned the Saudi led aggression of consequences of continuing its attacks and blockade of Yemen. We affirm our readiness to carry out more military operations operations in the future. Saudi Defense Ministry has confirmed the Yemeni attack on an oil products distribution station in Jizan. The ministry said it will take action to protect its oil exports. The latest attacks by the Yemeni army come on the sixth anniversary of the Saudi invasion of the country. The Yemeni army, backed by Ansarullah forces, has conducted similar attacks in the past. They say they are in retaliation for Riyadh's war that has so far claims tens of thousands of lives in Yemen. Press TV's Abdul Latif al Washali in Sana'a told me earlier the latest Yemeni attacks on Saudi Arabia are the largest operation against the kingdom since the beginning of the war. The Yemeni army integrates the uh, seventh year of war against the Yemeni people with the largest and the uh, biggest operation so far using 18 drones and uh, eight ballistic missiles targeting several facilities, economic facilities and military bases in Rastanura, Rabagh, Yamba, Jaizan, Dammam, uh, Asir. Uh, uh, the Yemeni army keeps intensifying its uh, operations and retaliatory attacks against Saudi Arabia. Aramco is now the main target for the Yemeni army as uh, it seeks to harm the uh, Saudi uh, economy. Uh, Yemenis today are entering the seventh year of war. They will be protesting in Sana'a and several governorates. Uh, tens of thousands will uh, uh, be out uh, uh, on the streets to uh, uh, voice and uh, uh, voice their voices uh, to the world that uh, they are coming to the seventh year with uh, uh, being stronger and being able to attack Saudi Arabia, being able to pressure Saudi Arabia to uh, make it seek uh, uh, for <coughs> peace and uh, uh, to stop its uh, war against Yemenis. To discuss the same issue, Mr. Tim Anderson is joining us. He is the director with the Center for Counter Hegemonic Studies uh, via Skype out of Sydney. Uh, Tim Anderson, it's good to have you with us. Uh, tell me how you react um, to this latest attack, which, mind you, our correspondent just said was the largest in its kind uh, since the beginning of the war. Thank you. Yes, the Yemeni army is certainly pressing its advantage, um, given that the Saudis are on the retreat um, and the, the so-called peace offering offered up and supported by the U.S. It was obviously a, a, a transparent attempt to try and uh, avoid that sort of retreat. But Yemen is still occupied in many respects. There's still a battle for the liberation of Marib, and I'm sure that Yemeni forces are going to try and press their advantage to secure a, a ceasefire on much more advantageous terms. Okay, Mr. Anderson, let's just go back to the beginning of the war. You know, incidentally, today I believe is the um, anniversary of this war, sixth uh, anniversary of the war. Uh, how would you comment on that? Do you say that Saudi Arabia has met the defined goals that it basically defined for itself, you know, the goals of this war, uh, and uh, perhaps um, any achievement that the Saudis have had, uh, those goals have been met. How do you react to that? Well, first of all, I would say that the Saudis are clearly acting as the agent of the U.S. here. Let's not be under any illusion that they are some independent force there. They are tiny puppet regime, basically, that has a lot of oil money. It was able to buy a lot of weapons, but they are serving the interests of Washington in its plan for a new Middle East to wipe out all of the independent political uh, will, the political states in the region, basically. And the um, a Ansar Allah-led government in Sana'a is one of the things that was very inconvenient to them. And, of course, Israel is also involved in this operation, along with the Emiratis. So the Saudis as the spearhead of that, if you like, have not achieved any of their objectives. They are, they've been 
on retreat for some time now. And as, you've, as your report points out, that's the Yemenis are pressing their advantage now, now that they have the upper hand. Uh, you mentioned uh, the Saudis being actually the hand of some larger powers and uh, perhaps, you know, change the equilibrium in the West Asia region, if I, um, if I understood correctly. Uh, those larger powers, you compare this to 2015. Uh, and, you know, it's very interesting, uh, Mr. Anderson, isn't it, that like six years ago, even people in news media, they hadn't heard the name Ansarullah, and right now it, they are a force to, 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 to reckon with. Uh, how has this really changed? the favor of those larger powers when you compare the West Asia region to what it was back in 2015? Yes, I think you're right to point out that 2015 was a turning point because at that stage, the two big counterweights, Iran and Russia, made some more concerted efforts, for example, in Syria and helped turn the tide there too. But uh, when we talk about Yemen, let's remember it's not simply Ansar Allah. Ansar Allah uh, created a very large coalition. Most of the Yemeni army defected to this coalition government, and it's had very strong popular support. So we shouldn't be under no illusions, even though the Western governments continue to maintain that a man under in house detention in Riyadh is the president of Yemen. We should be under no illusion that there is a quite a strong government with a strong public backing there, and despite the siege, they've demonstrated that they're able to resist and they're able to press their advantage. And you know, again, because it's the sixth anniversary, I'd like to seize this opportunity to ask you, what kind of a, a prediction do you have for the days to come? Perhaps, you know, uh, not only because of this uh, recent attack, you know, which will obviously bring about some, uh, you know, tit for tat move from the Saudi side, but basically where to go from now? You just said that the Saudis are, are b basically going back and, you know, are looking for ways to drag themselves out of this quagmire of a war. In what direction do you think 2021 version of the Yemen war will, uh, will be unfolding? Well, first of all, yes, it's correct to say that the Saudis have been looking for a way out um, for almost three years, really. Remember, they started some talks in, in Oman. They tried to find some way out without abandoning their project altogether because from the point of view of the regional war, which Washington is orchestrating, and which it announced in Israel in 2006, the idea of creating a new Middle East led by Israel and the Saudis, that is evaporating very badly. But of course, they're not able to accept defeat. They know that they're losing in Syria, they're losing in Iraq, they're losing in Yemen, um, but they don't like to accept that. So they're extending this. And I think we shouldn't underestimate the capacity of extending this losing gambit that the U.S. is involved in. And, and let's remember that the U.S. is always behind the Saudi hand here. Uh, again, before I let you go, because you just mentioned the very interesting point, let's not forget that uh, President Biden has just said that they won't be able to meet the deadline that they had for bringing out their forces on May the 1st. And, you know, that was a deal that they had with the Taliban. Interestingly, that they, they were the force together with Al Qaeda, actually, back in 2001. They were the force that were fighting. And now, after 20 years, they just sat down with them at the table and, and, and wrote an agreement. And, uh, and when you look at Afghanistan today, uh, there is still internal fighting. There, there can still be violence for the presence um, of the U.S. forces there. You know, I wonder if uh, we are to I don't know if you, we can actually generalize that strategy to what happens in Yemen as well. Uh, okay, if you say that Saudi Arabia is going to extend its war there and, you know, perhaps uh, come down hard with vengeance for each and every one of these attacks, are we going to see the repeat of this drag of a war that happened in Afghanistan, perhaps in, in this region, in this part of the world as well? Look, from the part of the Saudis, it may not be that they have the capacity to be able to press it. They're losing very badly on a number of fronts. But from the point of view of Washington, it's quite possible that they're going to uh, develop some idea of a retreat, let's say, from Syria and Iraq and handing over to subcontract their conflicts and their destabilization. Because remember, their second option, if they can't have the regimes they want in the region, they will try and destabilize them, divide them and keep them weak. Um, as long as possible. So, it's, it, it, of course, that's not necessarily going to work out very well for the Saudis. They have their own problems there, and they may not be able to respond easily. Mm -hmm. And in what way do you think that's going to benefit the U.S.? Uh, just in plain terms for our viewers, if the Saudis are keep, if the Saudis are kept by their Western backers uh, engaged in the in the fight of Yemen. I think the Saudis, from the point of view of the U.S., are expendable. If they can 
uh, keep them engaged, keep them um, Yemen under pressure, mm. while, of course, the US big plan, the great game, let's remember here, is trying to keep the resistance divided. What Israel fears, for example, is that you have a, a unified resistance on the border of occupied Palestine, and that's why the Israelis are hysterical about the Iranian, present, Iranian presence in Iraq and in Syria, too. So this is... Um, Part of the losing gambit, if I can call it that, is to try and keep this destabilization using as many proxies, as many other players as possible, using Mr. Erdogan in the north, using the Saudis to try and have this resurgence of Daesh in Iraq and in Syria, for example, placing Daesh in Afghanistan to try and help with the destabilization of Iran, trying to obstruct the extension westward of China, the Belt and Road, for example, this is the way Washington looks at it. And it may be that Washington has to restructure things because it is not losing on any of those, not winning on any of those fronts at the moment. Interesting angle. An interesting talk. Tim Anderson, Director for Center for Counter-Hegemonic Studies in Sydney. I really appreciate it.